on this beautiful September morning. Good to see you all. Um, I'm Lisa Vijos. I am the Poet Laureate of Sheboygan. And <laughs> thank you. It's a very fun thing to be. Um, this morning we're here to participate and celebrate 100,000 Poets for Change. Um, most of you have come to these events before and you know that 100,000 Poets started in 2011 and we've had a, a poetry event every year at the end of September kind of in, in tandem with this worldwide movement where there are poets and people just like us everywhere all over the world literally doing poetry events this week I have to come clean and tell you that the actual day of 100,000 Poets is next Saturday. -ish. But I was going to be out of town, and so you get to, the, the organizers of this, the originators of this uh, event have always said, it's the whole week leading up to it. So I'm like, okay, good, I will do that. And the purpose and the, the meaning behind it is simply to bring poets and voices together to speak about peace, justice, environmental sustainability, change you know what do, what do we want to see to make the world a better place um, and there's a lot of room in there for all different kinds of poems and voices and words so no no uh, hard fast rules but the idea is just to be together and uh, I do want to share one thing before I get everything rolling which is that whoa yikes this book has been created this is a, an anthology that i very honored I got to be on the editorial team. 100,000 Poets for Change, 10 plus years of poetic activism. Uh, I have copies. The list price on Amazon is $35, but today, because I love you all, if you wanna, you can get it for 20 bucks from me. Here, I have a box of books. So um, there's essays from the organizers from everywhere, Nigeria, Ireland, uh, Germany, just all over, and it's so, it was such an amazing journey to help put this book together. Um, I think I might have told you guys last year that the man who started this whole movement, Michael Rothenberg, he was suffering, he was battling cancer last year at this time. He passed away last November. So this is the first 100,000 Poets without Michael Rothenberg present on the planet. But I know he's smiling down and he's super happy to see all of you here and to listen to some great poetry and music. So I think without further ado, I'm going to put the mic down and introduce our local wonderful singer-songwriter, John Dahl, to kick off our event with a beautiful song. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. This is a, uh, this is a song that I wrote probably uh, 1970, 1970, the spring of 1970. So how long is that? 53 years ago? <laughs> and it was about a friend that I met. I was on a ship called the World Campus Afloat, the SS Rheindam, a Dutch ship. And we traveled around the world studying. And I met this uh, person. Uh, she was from uh, Newark, New Jersey going to Bloomfield College. I was at the University of Washington in Seattle and we, we traveled together for uh, a period of time and uh, I wrote this song about her. It's appropriate for change. last night when you got up and walked away the things we'd said seemed all so tried like sunshine on a perfect day you'd said how hard it was take each other home I disagreed with you because you 
changed your former tone of keeping freedom within yourself of keeping freedom within yourself the pressures of our lives keep constant if we accept and never change Treasures that we spite will haunt us if things aren't somehow rearranged. You'll find a way to turn if you believe your mind. There's really not much left to learn. You've neglected time, and if that happens, then we could love. And if that happens, then we could love. When that happens, then we will love. And when that happens, then we will love. La da 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 da, la da da da, my dear. Public Library for hosting us once again and uh, all the wonderful work they do for our community. Thank you, Mead. Thank you, volunteers who set up the chairs. And yes, so um, we're going to, I'm going to share, I'm going to start because I'm in charge of the mic. Uh, I'm going to read a poem. <laughs> and um, the Folks over in Stevens Point um, are doing a thing called a poetry walk. We're going to do one in Sheboygan next spring, so keep this in mind. But um, what they did was they invited poets to submit some poems, and they um, had a theme. And the theme was to speak in the voice of a um, character from your favorite book. So here's my poem. See if you can figure out who it is. Oh, and I should say, the poems are going to be posted in store windows all around in Stevens Point. And I don't know where my poem is, but it'll be somewhere. And when we do it in the spring, I hope some of you poets will submit and you'll have poems in the shop windows around here. So this one is called To Those Who Have Known Me. Like all things small, I felt kinship with that pig, that terrific and radiant pig. My web became a sparkling signpost of ephemeral messages in morning sun. Aiming to awaken and bedazzle the farmer, I wove melodious words that could not go unsung. Call it a miracle. E.B. did. Fern never doubted me. She hoped to save Wilbur too, a runt among pigs. Could some pig save a life? It could, it did. That humble pig lived beyond me many seasons. No farmer could have ever put him on a platter, served him up as bacon. My words, the reason. And when my story was banned in Kansas, I had to wonder, did those fools not read their Bible? Had they not heard of talking snakes, God's voice in a bush, 
Had they never known a miracle? Despite their righteousness and thanks to all their folly, it's plain to see they could never have known me. But Wilbur knew. And I hope, dear reader, when you were young, you did too. Thank you. All right. So, our first poet today is a longtime 100,000 Poets for Change devotee, Emily Kamen. Come on up to the mic, Emily. Hello. So, I panic wrote this this morning because I realized I didn't really have anything appropriate to read. So, obviously, it doesn't have a title because I am firmly against titles. <laughs> so, here we go. I stand in the woods, the sun low behind me, the moon rising before on the cusp of eternity, a moment caught in time like dew on a spider's web glistening fractals of possible futures, too many to possibly choose from, looking, looking, looking for a sign of fate's hand, until I close my eyes and leap, hoping the wind will guide me through, like the leaves starting to fall. Perhaps I too will be carried gently to the ground, to decay and rise once more as something new. for an early morning scribble. Totally awesome. Next up, our friend from Appleton, Tom Singleton. Uh, thanks, Lisa. Uh, I, I am glad that we're doing it this week and not next week, because otherwise you wouldn't be here next week. There'll be nine, there'll only be 999 poets for change, right? <laughs> I have a, a brief one for you. It's called A Walk in the Heavens. Any of you poets ever walk in the heavens? Ever you know, put yourself up in the stars at night or whatever? Well, this is what this is about. Take the rainbow bridge from our small orb. Walk the path of colors into night. For the world ends not on the mountaintop or even at the glowing moon. It soars through years of light beyond the beyond. Climb the star steps through the long night to other worlds of mystery. Here the walk uncovers our destiny, our destiny in the heavens. <clears throat> Do not, though, discard this earth like an empty tin can by the side of the road. Heal our planet if we are to survive, survive and be welcomed on others. Healing our planet is healing ourselves. We, the earth and the heavens, are one. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Next up is Mary Kozan. Come on up, Mary. I have, um, now Emily wrote one, Scribble wrote one this morning, Panic wrote one. I have three poems, the first of which I wrote years ago. They're all very short. And um, this first one, they're all about language also. This first one is, there is, is there a rhyme for orange? It's a poem and a lim limerick, kind of, sort of, based on life. Orange is the only one, there is no other, I once told my younger brother. It's the only word without a rhyme. I researched it for quite some time, and then, I tried to write a poem about pneumonia. I worked and thought and stretched my brain, puzzled and mused and toiled in vain. There just is no rhyme for pneumonia. Until I remembered Livonia and Estonia. And let's not forget about ammonia, but how to work them into a poem about pneumonia. There once was a teacher from Ionia 
who suffered yearly from pneumonia. But in 2001, she did not succumb. Told her doctor, if I do get sick, I'll phone you. <laughs> but, P.S., there still is no rhyme for orange. <laughs> the reason I'm doing three is that I get applause for each one. The second one is spelling, and it's more of a rant than a poem. There are three ways to spell two, and two ways to spell four. There are even two ways to spell one. But there's only one way to spell three. Is that fair? There are three there's, and two here's, and two where's. There are even two why's and two who's, if you count the way the owl spells his who. But there's only one what, and only one when. Is that fair? Some words are unnecessarily long, like unnecessarily. Why is there only one way to spell privilege? I'm sure you figure out what I meant without much trouble, even if I mixed up an I with an E. And what about phenomenon? Whose bright idea was it to use a PH instead of an F anyway? What drunken focus group agreed to that idea? I'm just saying that I think we'd have all have a lot less anxiety if we relaxed those spelling words just a little and put some third graders in charge of spelling. <coughs> I'm not done yet. <coughs> Mosquito. M-U-S-K-E-E-T-O-E. -E -E. Mosquito. Believe. B-E-E-L-E-E-V. Massachusetts. M-A-S-A-C-H-E-W-S-E-T-S, -E Massachusetts. Third graders should be charged. <laughs> and the third one is simply called language. Phonemes and morphemes, all parts of speech, sounds and words we use as we reach. Reach out to the world, reach into our souls. It's language we use to make ourselves whole. We use it to argue or to make love. We write poems and stories when inspired from above. Words that we think of, words that we say, words that we write down, words that we pray, words that tell jokes, words that make puns. Words that make pay compliments, words that poke fun, words that are hateful, words that can soothe, words that tell lies, words that tell truths, words that set the record straight, words that apologize we hope not too late, words that share, delight, and entrance, words that elaborate, enrich, and enhance. Words and sounds, all parts of speech, phonemes and morphemes we use as we reach, reach out to the world or deepen our souls. It's language we use to make ourselves whole. Thank you, Mary. When you were reading the poem about pneumonia, I, all I could think of before you said it was Alphonia. Oh, oh, yeah, and then you said it. That was so cool. Um, before I introduce the next reader, I just wanted to make sure, has anybody arrived and needs to sign the open mic list? Okay, I will come over to you. Great. Um, the next person up is James Hamilton. Hi, I'm James. Oh, even better. Thank you. So I'm going to try to see this, actually, because it's, uh, <laughs> okay. Um, so the first one's not about change. Um, I do a lot of these open mics. I went to Spring Green this past Monday, and while I was in the car, I, I wrote this going over there. Um, dictated to my phone, I guess, so. Um, first time I'm reading it out, though, so brand new. It's called Drive. Painted lines, green highway signs, reflection stripes, and brush-colored brush. Velvety, violet-gray asphalt on the ground, 
gravelly grooved concrete slush. Beautiful traction. And I look around, hard on believing, above the sun's beating, the air streaming, and the sound of the trees and the motors screaming. How the road can fill up the hollow inside, roads between here, there, and everywhere, stifling my run and hide, deflating my polka dot parachute, and generally pacifying my jitter buggy mind. So I don't give a so I don't care about any of it. Is it mental masturbation, thought process subjugation, subjective signals and information, distraction, reaction, extrasensory perception dumbed down? And I frown because I lost my place. I lost the why I'm in this race. And then again, was it even a race in the first place or just monkey shines all the time? Or is it all in my mind? Damn. Energy beaming back country, rat riddle, visual hallucination, audible paradiddle, telepathy steaming along, fortune teller programming, rewiring, wrong, code flaw, ball crystal mystic, some source sending misery, poison program psyche, energy algorithm pissing on me, duality interchange, one way a captive, one way free, most days neither switchback even feels like me. I shake my head, ears ringing in dread, Tears in my eyes, blood pressure rise, and I tell myself to focus on the road ahead and just f***ing drive. Yeah. Uh, we got one more. Um, so this is more about change, but it's more about uh, homeless people. I love this town. I come here. There's a lot of people that don't have anywhere to live in this town, and it's not right. It's just not right. $1,800 for a two-bedroom apartment is not affordable housing. It's called Under This Bridge. John eyed, his piercing, pensive pupils glare outward, articulating at best a dire man's lie. He scribbles altruistically, childlike and emblematic, as Walsh drawings can be. He writes in blood and, <laughs> and rain-soaked mud on pillars of concrete under the bridge, under the highway among the trash and needles and varied crud. His waif in rags and of wicked faith waits on the ground set in her place, a file of sticks and bones and teeth set just below her windswept face on a box. They're waiting for dinner to be done, a pigeon or maybe a dove splayed on an asphalt griddle searing in the afternoon sun. She swallows her spit and tastes an abscess, then fumbling it with her tongue as the cars overhead run and run and run. Smoke and exhaust and dust rot their lungs, and rust? Rust covers everything. Feeding off a of steely support lust, it is for them whatever the day brings, whatever the day must. Happy and irreverent to most, drunk and sleeping against the post, on the iron and cement and the tar, through rise and falls, through it all, they call this home, each stealing solace in the fact that neither of them is alone, such as life on their edge such as life under this bridge. Thank you. Hey, James. Um, let's see, next up, Georgia Ressmeyer. Welcome, Georgia. The News from Niger. Um, it's a two-part poem, and it's the only one I'll read, so. <laughs> the News from Niger arrives before our latest mass shooting. Violent events even from dreamland. Am I addicted to horrendous happenings and confusion? Whenever hope and joy break through, not often now, I don't know where to put them. They are lovely gifts deserving display in places of honor. Sometimes they even make me forget that we humans, linked on the eons long train of evolution, are fast approaching the end of the line. The whistle blows almost continuously but goes unnoticed. 
No one puts on shoes or gathers possessions. Believers believe heaven awaits them. Skeptics anticipate a lot of pain followed by a deep sleep that could last forever, an attractive prospect for insomniacs like me. Humanity is getting what we deserve for wasting and despoiling Earth, failing to live up to our potential for kindness. As for joy, it is a succession of rare moments of connection that warm our insides better than cognac. Hope and joy flash past quickly, glorious presence, but oh so transient. Two, peace has to be made with each new day, not if you've come to torture me, go away, but come in and tell me what you have to say. Peace is sometimes enigmatic, as in the peace that passes all understanding. More often, it's mundane. You stay on your side of the line, I'll stay on mine. What kind of day is this? A day of truce, it seems, not dread, facing facts, loss, and painful truths, but faith in change. It's trusting that some may live to bask in clean air and water again, and that peace and justice can prevail if enough of us commit to a place for all to flourish. Today, at least, there's still a chance to pass the test. Thank you. Thank you, Georgia. Next up is Tad Fippenwenty. Welcome to the mic. You live in Port Washington, do you know? Tad from Port Washington. Good, I think. Sorry. I should also say one thing. Tad was a teacher for many years at North High School and then at Etude School, and many young poets have risen up out of her ranks, so thank you, Tad Wendt. I don't know where they are today, but they're, they're making poetry. <laughs> okay. Um, one, th one reason I think life is so stressful is because of all the things we can't unlearn. You know, once you learn it, then there you are. I'm going to read a poem called When the World. I wrote this a while ago. As a child, I believed the moon was flat, like a circle of paper or felt or color form plastic stuck to the face of the sky. It followed me from the farm where my grandparents lived in the old white house with tall gray ceilings and an attic. It followed me to my house where I lived with my parents under the Milky Way next to the Great Lake. I would lean my cheek against the car door and stare up through the smooth black glass at my flat moon etched with tree branch shadows and wonder how it could possibly know to follow me along the country highway, through two small towns, into my own yard, to my bedroom window, and drop its silvery messages onto the water of the lake for me to see. Last night, I viewed the moon from the beach by telescope. For a moment, I saw its personal geography, scarred skin, its craters puckering, embarrassed, its beckoning mountains and flat desert lakes. I marveled at the stiff toothpick flag I could not see and worried over footprints and tire tracks, our greedy misuse. And I think the moon knew I was looking. In its glorious night shadow curve, it melted in the lens and it still looked flat to me. Next up, 
Dana Boyer from right here in Sheboygan and all over the world she's lived. <laughs> I'm going to read one poem that's in three parts that I've been working on lately. It's called What We Will Be, part one. The night follows the sunset like smoke. The French open up their metal shutters, one last gasp before tomorrow, which will reach 100 degrees like it never has before. A barefoot father walks his baby to sleep across the street. Already his baby only knows this world. She does not need to be prepared. He does this for himself. When my son was young, very young, and saw a picture of the autumn leaves, he said, fire, fire, because he already knew exactly how things die. The attic window winks the last sunset back. Part two. The sun rises hazed and gasping while Canada burns. On the river, the weeping willows barely grasp the water. It is the shortage, so they say, and there is, not, and there is not enough water to save all the lives we've left behind. And wait, if you will listen, just a minute, there is not enough water to put out the fire in the garage. The fire chief's report said buttons were found across it, as if my grandpa tried to yank his shirt off in his panic, his hands already among the flames. Forgive me, I do not mean to say we all will die of fire, only that he did. Part three. On an Okinawan beach, my son stops eating sand long enough to watch the dark pile above the horizon. Japanese has 1,190 rain-related words, and I only know three of them. They say the storms in the Pacific are strengthening now, that they will keep growing and swirling and adding to themselves, that they will build their lightning and feed it heat, shoveling darkness into their ever hungry mouths before drowning this island and whatever garage fires are in its way. After the typhoon passes, my son flattens his face against the window, marveling at the flooding streets. I write down the words I know, Suyu, rainy season, Uchiyami, rain that enters with wind, and Uteki, for single raindrop. In these words, there is enough water to save some of our grandfathers, to save some of our children. Thank you, Dana. Next up, straight from Sheboygan Falls, Marilyn Zelke Window. Come on up, Marilyn. I think that's good. Hello. Thank you, Lisa, for this opportunity and Mead, Jean. What can I do for mankind? There's a young man who fights homelessness by walking great distances alone with only a backpack. As a studious youth in central Virginia, he walked more than 500 miles to Newton, Massachusetts to attend Boston College on a full scholarship. His hope in walking was to raise money for those without shelter, as he had been via a GoFundMe fund, National Alliance to End Homelessness. He then applied for law school. Again, he walked over 27 miles a day, sleeping beneath underpasses, companioned by stray dogs, to law school, from Caroline, Georgia, to the University of Georgia in Athens. Over several over several hundred thousand dollars have been raised through his efforts. We, as individuals, see the myriad problems of our society, of our country, of our earth. We ask the question, what can I do for mankind? There are so many answers. Plant pollinator gardens, 
Recycle plastics. Adopt a feral cat and get it spayed. March in protest of inequality. March for climate change reductions. Vote, vote, vote. Right, right, right. Use your voice for change, for help, for progress, for equality, for understanding, for peace. I like to listen to or watch PBS and listen to WP. Anyway, embrace the gift. <clears throat> Deepak Chopra voices words to me tonight on PBS. He speaks of the value of meditation. Count, count breaths, count minutes, count time, let thoughts flow. Breathe in history. Remember those who touched your life. Your grandmother's invitation to enjoy her backyard playhouse. Walks with your mother on wildflower strewn paths. Your father reciting Longfellow. Fuzzy childhood dog friends. Acknowledge gratitude. Thank the neighbors for cookies, for supplying water to your garden when you're absent for gifting apples, tomatoes from theirs. Respond with thanks to friends who want to help you in your time of need with transportation, food, companionship. Friendship truly is a gift, a gift to humans, a tie that binds, the commonality which asks and provides a solution to differences, a path to peaceful understanding. Thank you, Marilyn. Okay, next we have a little musical interlude from the wonderful and amazing Sheboygan phenomenon, the Raging Grannies. Would you come up? Carolyn Dell, Lily Gourmet, Carol Rittenhouse, and Teresa Moreno come to the stage and wow us with some, some music. And then Lily's going to stay on and do a poem after. So there we go. six groups of Raging Grannies, and so, um, and we're all going to share our stuff, so here we go. Raging Grannies are conspiring to make folks laugh a lot. Satire is so very frightening, it must be a terrorist plot. Listen to our conversation. We rage for peace, not war. For dignity and democracy, hear our voices soar. Metal in our hips, metal in our knees, hiding weapons none can see. Now you found us out, you know what we're about. Peace and social justice conspiracy. Someone singing for justice. Someone singing for an end to war. Someone singing and spreading the truth. Scaring folks to the core. They're scared of gaggles of grannies singing our songs. Gaggles of grannies make folks quake. Gaggles of grannies must be washed. Your security is at stake. Grannies with our hats, a bunch of old bats, scaring folks with what we sing. If we stay in tune, 
that, that could spell their doom, spreading freedom and democracy. We're raging, Granny's singing for justice. Granny's singing for an end to war. Granny's singing and spreading the truth. World peace forevermore. This is our land together. We need to make it what we want it to be. Yes. <clears throat> This land is our land, our land together. And when we share it, it just gets better. When we look out for our friends and neighbors, that's what America can be. This land has people of all religions. We're all Americans beneath diverse skins. If you wear headscarves or hold a rosary, this land was made for you and me. This land is queer folk and newly here folk, female and male folk, dark-skinned and pale folk, with our commitment to love and liberty. We'll, we'll remake this land for you and me. <coughs> From many countries, we brought traditions, and we can share them here in Wisconsin. For we're together in peace and harmony. This land was made for you and me. This hands hold some truth to be self-evident that inequality is un-American. We live together and we can all be free when this land achieves its destiny. This land is our land, our land together. And when we share it, it just gets better. When we look out for our friends and neighbors, that's what America can be. That's what America will be. Um, no. Well, you can hold this. No, it's okay. Um, the poem I'm going to read is one I wrote some time ago. It's called Delusions. We like to think that we're the top, the ultimate cream of nature's crop. Our status, we're sure, will never stop. We'll just improve. And as to greater heights we soar, improving our lot and planning more, we don't even bother to ask what for. We're in the groove. We build our empires and tear them down. We pave the planet with city and town. <clears throat> with blinding lights and with screaming sound, we make our mark. With the highways and skyways and ships at sea, <clears throat> we harness the land that once was free, denuding the forest of every tree to build a park and though we're certain we know the score, know who, what, when, where, and even what for, the truth is the earth holds immeasurably more that we don't know. We govern and manage in nature's name. We don't know the rules, but we play the game. We're well-intentioned, but just the same. Look out below. Instead of living as part of earth, in respecting nature and knowing its worth, 
We act as though everything since its birth belongs to man. We like to think that we're the elect, the ne plus ultra, but I suspect we're nothing more than one more sad reject in nature's plan. And when our time of ascendancy is done, and Earth's once again wild and free, its fauna and flora on land and sea once more to roam, perhaps the next species to multiply will neither reason nor wonder why, but find it sufficient to live and die in Earth its home. Thank you, Lily and everyone from the Raging Grannies. Awesome to have you here today. Um, next up is Mary Fleischman. Good morning. And this is such a wonderful event, and I'm so glad I'm still alive to be here, so thank you. <laughs> um, I have two poems, neither of which I have written. Um, the first is by uh, Darcy Yamara, and some of you may be familiar with her. She's a political activist. Uh, she was born in Nicaragua. She's a strong advocate for women's rights. Um, she's married. Um, has three children, does a lot of lecturing at San Francisco, at the University in, in San Francisco. And her poem is titled, The Song of Hope. One day the fields will be forever green and the earth will be black, sweet and moist. Our children will grow tall on, on hope and the children of our children and they will be as free as the trees and the birds of the wilderness. Each morning they will awake in the joy of having life and will know that the earth was reconquered for them one day. Today we plow the parched fields, but each furrow is soaked with blood. The second um, is written by Ann Hayden, and she is a member of the Mary Knowles Sisters. Um, she is a, did a lot of work in both Korea and Nicaragua as a public health nurse, and she also has worked diligently on the Save the Children program. So her poem is titled Common Ground. There is a common good a best practice of the human community, a stance of solidarity and right relationship with all of creation. It is as simple as breathing and ordinary as dirt. It is as warmly nourishing as newly baked bread, strongly supportive as a neighbor's solid shoulders, richly fertile as moist earth, and as available as an attentive friend. This sacred field of communion is turned and tilled by willing hearts, seated with honest truth, watered with the abundant tears of forgiveness, cultivated in service to one another, and harvested in a mutually fruitful love. It is the good ground we stand on together. It is the God space of our interabiding where we know deeply the communion that is gift to be received, given, and received again in the round dance of God's life in all. Thank you. Thank you, Mary, for sharing some poems from the book that you brought seems like an anthology of women activists, so thank you for that. Um, our next reader is George Henniger. 
Come on up, George. There's one more after you, and then there's the featured reader who I will introduce in a moment. Hello. Good morning. And uh, it's good to see everybody here. Uh, I'm going to try to be a little theatrical about this, if you don't mind. What I found, I now hold so precious and unexpected. Beauty that obsesses and absorbs just its touch. It takes me to places I want to be forever. Then I notice it's not what it, what, what, but it was once. And the tarnish fades into decay. As its whole becomes its parts and starts to slip away. What it was before is never more. Now tears mix with the dust. Have another short one that you want to This is in small print, so uh, sorry, the other one. Many said it was not true, even as it happened over and over, us versus them, it was whispered every day, ours is ours, period, and it had to be to protected from those who would take it, but the churning never ended from those who would dare to stop progress. Those little irritations just kept coming again and again. And the winds began to change. And things became different. Thank you. Thank you, George. Um, next is Heather Hanlon. And I see her holding little Violet there. So bring Violet. No. <laughs> you want to come up and read poetry with your mom, Violet? Maybe stay with Daddy. Could be easier for Mom. Lisa for having us here. I was gonna have Violet do diddle diddle dumpling. If you change your mind, Violet, let me know. The mic is yours. I want to read a poem by Audre Lorde, um, and then I'll read one of my own. But I'm so sick of my own poems, and I feel like most people can probably relate to that. <laughs> um, so I'm, the poem that I'm gonna read that I wrote is like, the oldest poem that I still have managed to keep a PDF of in my computer. Because apparently I'm not sick of that one. So, uh, this is a poem by Audre Lorde, though, from her book, The Black Unicorn. Is this a good volume? Yeah. All right. A Litany for Survival. For those of us who live at the shoreline, standing upon the constant edges of decision, crucial and alone, for those of us who cannot indulge the passing dreams of choice, who love in doorways coming and going, in the hours between dawns looking inward and outward, 
at once before and after, seeking a now that can breed futures like bread in our children's mouths, so the dreams will not reflect the death of ours. For those of us who are imprinted with fear, with a faint line in the center of our foreheads, learning to be afraid with our mother's milk, for by this weapon, this illusion of some safety to be found, the heavy-footed hoped to silence us. For all of us, this instant and this triumph, we were never meant to survive. And when the sun rises, we are afraid it might not remain. When the sun sets, we are afraid it might not rise in the morning. When our stomachs are full, we are afraid of indigestion. When our stomachs are empty, we are afraid we may never eat again. When we are loved, we are afraid love will vanish. When we are alone, we are afraid love will never return. And when we speak, we are afraid our words will not be heard nor welcomed. But when we are silent, we are still afraid. So it is better to speak, remembering we were never meant to survive. So this is a poem that I wrote um, when I was an undergrad, which was really long ago. And yeah, it feels like really long ago now that I have a kid, you know, my time just feels like it progresses so much more quickly, I guess. But um, just, it just feels weird, you know? So uh, here we go. It's called 1998 in Claire de Lune. And it's from former Heather to you. Uh, there we go. The spacecraft is searching. El Nino is settling in the atmosphere and the people. There's movement, like the one I played on piano, Claire de Lune. That year I'd be nine, and sometimes Caitlin wanted to pretend to be boys at recess, and sometimes she wanted to pretend to die. And we'd laugh. Our gasping scratched God's ear. There's a funny thing. It falls up into tornadoes and drips down the cracks of plates who moan as they break apart. The earth was moving and it was ripping us apart. I learned about it in science. We also learned about overpopulation. But I never worried because if nature didn't take care of it, I'm sorry. If nature didn't take care of it, we would. On Mondays, I heard about Ontario Philo, and Elia and Relazane, and Sidi Hamed, and Manila, and Birmingham. Every Monday, my mother drove me to piano lessons, and the radio cracked like sparks and guns through the speakers. I used to think the static was on purpose, like sound effects. And that was January. Sometimes I hated piano lessons. Mrs. Peterson was so stern, and she played so fast that the piano began to turn into static too but not Claire de Lune. That was always slow. It never ended before it had to. I didn't know how rare that was. I didn't know how skinny the thread was that everything tried upon. When I moved away, Caitlin cried. To children, moving is an earthquake and piano lessons and injustice. As she ran after my car, I decided we all die little deaths. Later I found out who made my doll from Manila. Later I found out the bomb in Birmingham went off in an abortion clinic. Later I found out I could never really be a boy. And it's not like I didn't understand death before. It was just further away from me. But now the gasping comes locked up in between tears because I know we are alive. The always nearing, the crack in the radio, the last stanza, the moon rising. And the final black note of Claire Dillon. Thank you, Heather. All right. Our featured reader today is an award winning poet many times over, including a Fulbright Fellowship in Bangkok, Thailand. 
I learned in email exchange with him that his grandparents lived in Sheboygan, and he remembers many a Christmas spent here in his youth. He currently lives in Fort Atkinson and is an associate professor of languages and literatures at the University of Wisconsin-Whitewater. And I am so honored to invite to the mic here at 100,000 Poets for Change, our Wisconsin Poet Laureate, Nicholas Gulick. Please give him a warm Sheboygan welcome. Is that good? Is that good? I'll just step, I'll just step on that. <laughs> um, it's nice to be back in Sheboygan. Uh, my grandparents passed away quite some time ago, and I don't make it back here uh, as much um, as much as I wish I did. But I, I do have uh, a lot of really wonderful memories uh, growing up here in the summers and Christmases and Thanksgivings. I'm going to read a series of what I think are love, essentially love poems. Uh, I think w w whatever changes we want to see enacted in, in the world, my sense is that it is because of and, and for people who are other than ourselves, uh, particularly um, because of uh, our parents who came before us and, and for our children who come after us. This is a poem from a book called Orient, called An Image of the Book in Which I Hear You. If there is standing water in the desert, if there is water and I am standing over it, staring down into the murk or mirror of the pool, if I am breathing, if I can see myself in the oasis, if I am speaking and there is water and you are there, if you are also speaking, if we can hear across the water our voices carrying in opposite directions, our voices carrying. If our languages unspool in blue drifts against the distance, escaping reticence. If the distance of our reticence is false, if it isn't crossable, if we cross it anyway, who will carry us? If our narratives erase us, if our histories return to us as names, if we are living in the error of our alphabets, if the center of the letters hurt, master, stranger, what is water, where is water safe if solitude displaces us, if we are homeless, finally, each of us, if we wander past each other, our faces moored to their reflections, the edges wrecked, is it imaginary? If the images we make remake us, if there is mercy in us, if our speaking changes and we ourselves are changing, making, if we are made in the image of the other, in ambiguity and contradiction, if we consent to not be solitary, if we imagine we are somewhere, if there is shore. So just just a few a uh, few poems. A couple of them are longer, so um, I don't want to keep you too long. They'll be like 15 minutes or so. Uh, these are all from uh, the collection that I'm working on right now, which is called The Other Altar. And this is a poem called of Genesis. The origin of every book is lost. There is not a word in the beginning, and language always listens to its end. Tell me what has left its mark upon the names you give to stars you cannot see, and I will try to break the sentence into something strange enough to trust. Look, the world is blue as death down here already. The air is poisoned by our breath. It's getting difficult to teach our children how to speak by speaking. Poetry. In the breath of the book, before the book, and after. In the blue periphery of after. In the aperture of speech. In the green infinity of reading. 
in the bleak community of loss, in the terror of the margins blossoming, in the violence of the mind's arrival blossoming, in the perforated space of utterance, in the unnameable hallucinations of the alphabet, in the bright sobriety of awe, in the illuminated wake of wonder, a world unfurling in the mute cathedral of the interior, in the still uncertain music of the interior, in the porous borders of the image, in the day-glow ruins of the dictionary, in the pregnant lapse of reason, in the seedling gaps of exposition, in the song-drawn logic of the dream, in the beautiful collapse of the house of language, in the extravagant expanse of the house of language, in the structure of a garden's darkness, a mouth in the wilderness, the tongue unraveling, in the light that isn't light, in the open doorway of the eye. There's um, a series of, of poems that I've been working on that are essentially woven together narratives. So they're, they're, they're pieces of, of prose that I've, that I've written, each about different subjects. Uh, and this one, for example, it's uh, prose from like my kind of scholarly efforts, uh, studying the poetry of John Keats, uh, prose uh, recollecting, recollecting uh, the Minneapolis riots after the George uh, Floyd uh, lynching, um, trying to writing about uh, planning a garden with, with my daughter, uh, research um, that I was doing on pollinators, things like that. So I'm, I'm weaving together different pieces of prose and then it turns in, turns into a, a poem, essentially. I think one of, the, one of the insistences that poets have is that the word uh, connects, uh, connects to itself. And I suppose this is an experiment uh, <laughs> testing that. This is called Oma Tidio. In Keats's letters, the poet makes a specter of his aesthetics. Beauty should obliterate. As the riots burn in Minneapolis, I plant bee balm with my daughter in our yard. Because my friend in prison helps white supremacists write letters to their lovers and blinks himself to sleep, the police lights rising from the streets like little tongues beyond the dead insistence of their song upend the dumb capacity for grace. What must we forgive? To see a single flower in a field of other flowers, Keats insists that we abandon our identity. The lynching ruptured everything. To sustain the colony, a worker bee goes forth in early light and lingers. Sitting in the grass, we listen, the drone of tiny wings adrift between the patchwork patternings of violets, a kind of language glittering. At first, my daughter is afraid. When the open field between a thesis and its antithesis evaporates, Keats, Keats insists the arguments regarding art begin to dovetail in the mind. I want to think that he is right. The light of a convergence arriving on an altar I imagine centered somewhere in me like a soul. The city burning on a live stream while I send messages to friends illuminates my living room. When my daughter pushes seeds into the dirt, she asks if she is hurting it. A violent brightness casts a dark catastrophe across the wall. Capable of seeing ultraviolet light, the sun despite the clouds, the compound eyes of bees are covered with tiny follicles that sense the wind's direction. A disquisition, not dispute, on a myriad of subjects strikes me. I try to write a letter to my friend and find myself among a numb cacophony of distances, admitting my mistakes. What is true enough to render? This, for Keats, is the burden of the mystery of liberating doubt. When my daughter asks if cops are bad, I grab her hand and say that in the morning we'll check to see if anything is sprouted. This pursued through volumes illuminates the call of all consideration. How beautiful the retired roses folding over in the night wind breaking. How fact and reason seem to fall away. My faith in people 
the pistol and the stigma and the seed. When the workers first emerge, their hair is edged in silver and their wings are soft, paper thin and crumbled. I tire early in the aftermath and think it's sad that the specific composition of all materia varies between organisms, the world appearing differently as a matter of blind mechanics. When I drive across the country to see my friend in the Elkton Federal Correction Institution, I stand in a line of children in the jail yard waiting with their mothers to see their dads. All of us are earth dark. I find I cannot exist, says Keats. It is easier to say what poems should be than write them, and so I find myself suspended in a landscape made of years and long apologies. In the prison cafeteria, my friend says the thing that shocks him most is how illiterate the inmates are. Queen bees brood their eggs like birds and place them in a pollen ball. When my daughter comes home from school, she asks if the police would ever hurt her mother, and then we sit in silence. The silence ruptures us, a thing we cannot see that enters slowly through the ear and lingers, a wilderness approaching the immediate emergency of wreck, not a self so much, a subject. Thus the music of the poem is what the mouth becomes when language leans into uncertainty. Landscape is imaginary. Every morning when I wait in line in the Luther Elementary parking lot among the other parents dropping off their kids, I count the thin blue line police flags plastered to the metal bumpers of their trucks. Colonies exist to feed the queen's demand for sweetness, and this too is a kind of silence lingering. I want to tell my daughter about the summer I was 17 in Minneapolis, a punk show at a venue called the Bomb Shelter, how the cops came in and punched the brown kids standing next to me. In my memory, my mind goes blank on impact, my body acting on its own. For the first time, I find myself beyond myself, the crowd erupting all around me and spilling out into the streets of the same precincts burning on my phone today some 20 odd years later. I want to tell her that my friends together picked me off the ground and took me to the hospital, but instead I tell my students that the poet is at once the possessor and the possessed, the colonizer and the colonized, and that for Keats, language, when it is working, takes away our names. It surprises me to learn that bees have five eyes, three of which see only shadow, but not the shape that casts it. Maybe this is beautiful. Vision is diverse, all oh, for a life of sensation rather than of thought. Every morning, the flowers we have planted start to fall apart, folding inward toward a center that is only partially there. My friend is out of prison. He's married now and has a daughter of his own. Every month, he sends me records in the mail with little notes explaining his experience of song. Since an image from the compound eye is created from a set of independent elements, bees can only see that part of the picture directly there in front of them. It is difficult to know the world as someone other than yourself. To sense through nothing more than shadow, there is in you a garden somewhere planted by a stranger, where the spirit you imagine passing through you glides against another person's body like a ghost. Keats believes that if the poem does not come naturally, like leaves to a tree in spring, it should not come at all. The riots rise and fall around my daughter like a century. The average lifespan of a worker bee is six to seven weeks. My dreams do not relieve me. In time, as the workers cross the distance from one flower to another, heading home to feed their queen, their wings deteriorate, battered by a wind that used to carry them. Laughing in a pool of pollen-colored light, my daughter sings my name and arranges yellow petals in a circle at my feet. In the chamber of our maiden thought keeps forewarns a darkening 
The police are everywhere and nowhere. My daughter tells me I am standing in the sun. Can you do three more? Is that good? Um, I'm going to read a poem from my wife, uh, a poem from my dad, and a, a poem from my kids. This is called Border Work. Our being here together as the night struck violet plucked from an edge blue curve of air. The light does not absolve us. Because we named our children in the margin of a garden's darkness, the white rose listens. I love the thousand shades of you. Every morning, our daughters sleep beyond themselves in day glow. The house grows quiet in their wake. To the place where you should be, I lash the ache of every brightness I've disfigured, the years that we have left. Bury with me the bottom half of fence posts in the yard. Pack the loose dirt harder. These days I'm beginning to believe that I belong here. Because we chose to raise our children in the center of an empire, the low grass glistens in the west wind. At night the sky edge finds us staring at our hands. It is easy to forget we left a world for this one. So um, uh, this is a, another one of those uh, poems where I'm weaving uh, prose writing together. So this, I'm trying to tell the story of uh, losing my dad uh, in 2015. Um, I'm uh, working on an essay about the poet uh, George Oppen, um, making sense of the uh, rac racially motivated mass shooting in, uh, in Buffalo. And um, and I'm talking about uh, th this memory that I have from uh, grad school in a uh, translation class. This is why it's fun to go to PhD school as a poet for a, a translation class. Um, I had to de destroy a text uh, that I love, so I took one of my favorite books of um, books of poems out into the the woods and uh, shot it. This is called Book of Difference. To write the book a second time, I shoot it. When my father dies, I leave the room and stand alone at the end of a long hall looking down on Minnesota. I know of no other happiness writes often but the mind rising into what is there. It's summer in the Middle West and 10 are dead in Buffalo. I call a friend and weep into the telephone. A field of knee-high grass surrounds me. I lay the book against the tree stump. Confronted by police, the shooter removes his armor in a fluid motion close to grace. The hall is empty. He sets his weapon briefly against his chin and then surrenders. The switchgrass sways. Every time I stare along the rifle's spine and pull the trigger, buckshot scatters in the bright light. The pages separate. The book begins to pull itself apart. In the racist theory of replacement, men like me, women like my wife, children like my children stand to disenfranchise white men. For often, the failure of language to be transparent is a failure to move beyond the shipwreck of the singular, a falling short of love. I used to think there was no one I loved the way I loved my dad, but then I had a daughter. At night, I light a candle and tell his ghost I'm sorry. The echo of a gunshot slants against the hills. The book begins to blossom. Although his actions resonate beyond the single moment of their occurrence, rippling outward, the bullets proving that the borders of the self are porous, the shooter is alone. 
When my sister calls to tell me I need to make it home, I'm poor and living in a small apartment half a world away in Thailand. When I put the phone against my chest and hold it, I turn to the woman who is now my wife in the room, begins to shrink around a silence, the likes of which I know today my children will also have to someday navigate without me. In Jean Raspal's 1973 novel, The Camp of the Saints, brown immigrants band together to overrun the continent. My daughters scream, their, scream each other's names and sprint across the yard. The weapon heavy in my hand, the book unfurling upward. I've barely written since I've had kids, so when a girl I used to think I'd marry suggests we work together on a book, I'm afraid. In my memory, I set the rifle down and lay alone beside the book and let the light across my face go forth without the need to name it. For you and of you, I begin. I am growing in the cold stone garden in my basement, and then the poem falls out of me like water. When my youngest daughter reaches for the picture of my dad I keep on a shelf above my record, she asks me what it means to die. The poem prescribes itself its ending, a silent litany of grief. My daughter pauses. Death, I say, is when a person turns just small enough to climb alone into the hearts of those they've left behind and live there. It is a place often writes nothing has entered it, nothing has left. The depth of water pours from all its sources. My earliest memory is of a dream in which my father disappears into a painting of a ring of children holding hands that used to decorate my bedroom. In it, I'm alone and screaming out his name. When I wake up, the screen remains, but this time he's sitting in the room beside me and saying it's okay. Strangely, some 30 odd years later, these same words these same words promising my safety are the last I'll hear him speak. I cannot even altogether now disengage myself, Oppen writes, remembering the men he left to die behind him in the war. I pick the book up off the ground and carry it. As versions of white replacement theory overrun the continent, my daughter climbs into my lap, puts her head against my chest, and says, my dad's awake in there. When I can't write a poem, I feel alone in a world of corporations, standing in a hall of endings, listening. The names of the dead, according to their faces, blur into the general onslaught of the news. I, too, like you, am guilty of forgetting. In the passing of the great race, Madison Grant posits that genetic dissolution will cause the West to fall. Every night, my daughter puts her face against my cheek and whispers in my ear. Rome begins to burn a second time, the ghost of Athens, all of Alexandria. The book is lighter now and larger. Because my dad will never meet my kids, I'm trying to remember him when he was young. But the older that I get, the more the form I apprehend appears increasingly transparent. His language failing him a day before his body does. I want to live forever so that my kids will never need to write a poem like this. But so does everyone, I think, and so my hope is done. My daughter kisses me, and I promise silently inside myself that I'll remember the weight her face exerts against my own, the quiet pressure of her mouth, a kind of music moving through me, blooming. In the garden of my memory, I guard the growing darkness of my grave and drag a branch across the wild grass and sing. My singing ceases. In the room, my father is growing smaller. And I read to him until my shoulder slumps against his deathbed. I have not and never did have any motive but to achieve clarity, writes often. 
My daughter is sleeping in the other room, appears to me the reason there is light. The absolute singular, the unearthly bonds of the singular. When you met my mother, I often wonder if my dad imagined me. If at some point, and only for a moment, I existed long before my body did. A single candle flickers near a picture of my father on an altar in a room reserved for living. The book I shot is now alive in this book. The light of the pages packed against each other exposes the new day. And um, thank you, um, thank you for being here, um, for hosting events like this in Wisconsin. One of the incredibly uh, necessary and surreal experiences I've had since becoming the poet laureate of the state that I was born in, in January, is being invited to all these little literary pockets um, in a state where, when I was growing up as a writer. A young writer, you know, Claire, it felt like I was the only person here. <laughs> it felt like I was the only person doing this thing that felt so important to me. And it was so, Wisconsin was so lonely uh, then. And now, every, almost every weekend I'm gone, um, which is lonely, I suppose, in a different way, because I'm always driving. But uh, there's communities like this all over our state. I think, if anything, when I'm done doing this uh, in a couple years, I think that's what I'll take. That's what I'll take with me. Um, that's why this position has been uh, so necessary. This is a poem from my daughter's called "Eulogy While Living." If I last long enough to listen, these dreams of spring I've tucked into a book will sound the pallid apex of my laps. Paint them with me, daughter. Make me brighter. The earth is dark as money. Still, I've got a better singer's rendering of God inside me. Blueprint of the aftermath, these seeds of grief perennial. If I was ever good to you, or if the lake in which the night dissolves returns to you your name, Plant them near me like the living altar of a prayer I failed to offer. And teach your girls when they come home to you like lanterns, the porous edge of every utterance of soul. By the time you're old enough to read this, by the time there isn't time, the song does not belong to us. Forgive me. I want to be remembered. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I was struck by what you said about, you know, pockets and communities of poets everywhere throughout the state. And it's true. And, and uh, that made me think that I want to put in another plug for the 100,000 Poets for Change book because what I didn't say at the beginning is there's probably close to 100 essays from, like I said, people all over the world, over the U all over the US. And you read these essays of what people have been doing in their own communities for poetry and activism, and you just get so, you get goosebumps, because it's like, it makes me feel like part of something bigger. You know, we, when you write a poem, you're sort of like at your desk or wherever you are, and you think, oh, who cares about this? But it's actually something that brings us together, and we see reflections of each other in, in the poems. And it was just so beautiful hearing everybody today. And thank you for coming, Nick. It was. Really, really great to have you here. And thank you to Jeannie Gartman and the library for hosting us. And just Sheboygan is a great place, I must say. Um, I want to read you one last poem. Is that OK? Can I do that? And then I'm going to turn the mic over to John, who will sing us a song and tell us some cool stuff that's going on also today. So hang on. Got to put this down. Oh, book, $20. That's $15 off the list price. You really should buy it. Oh.
Okay, there's lots of pictures in it, too. Okay. Um, one of the fun things about being Poet Laureate, I don't know if you've done this, Nick, but I've been asked to write what are called occasional poems for things going on in the city, and that's always kind of a fun challenge. So when our current mayor was um, instated, he asked me if I would write a poem for his uh, the ceremony. So I'm like, mm, okay. So this is what I came up with. And it makes me feel like uh, how we're all a part of something. So that's why I wanted to share it in closing today. Um, it's called If a City. If a city was a story, it would begin long before streets and structures. It would begin with land and proximity to water and people who lived there before it was a city. If a city was a poem, it would be spoken in slow, meandering lines with a litany of occurrences, triumphs, missteps, and, and resolutions. There would be growth, and it would not always rhyme. If a city was a sentence, it would be declarative. It would have a noun, like neighbor or friend, and many verbs igniting action. Create, discover, help, flourish, dream, propose, remember. The adjectives in the city would write themselves and would be testimony to all the good works of the people who live there. Thriving, generous, just, compassionate, and welcoming. There would be no period at the end of the sentence because like a poem, the city is always unfolding towards something better. And everyone who lives in that city adds their voice to the story, has a hand in its making. So take that with you today, my city compatriots. And um, yeah, John Dahl, you're up. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Um, two, two announcements. Uh, this is a great event, and I wanted to remind all of you poets and songwriters and just writers in general that we have uh, an open mic very much run on the same thing, the same sort of format here that, that we do here. It's at uh, Kelly Holstein's Word Haven bookstore. And it's uh, in the uh, upstairs now in an old dance studio above uh, Rudnick Jewelers. And it, it's the first Wednesday of each month. So the next one coming up is uh, a week from this coming Wednesday on October 4th. And it goes from 6 to 8. And uh, a lot of you have been participating in it. And anybody from anywhere is welcome to, to show up for that. Uh, the other event that uh, Lisa mentioned that there this afternoon in Sheboygan Falls, 101 School Street in the uh, old middle school for Sheboygan Falls is a play, a musical play that is uh, lasts about 50 minutes, and it's a tribute to Evelyn Prevenis. I don't know if, it, if any of you know Evelyn Prevenis. She's a 96-year-old treasure of the community. Uh, she she's a poet, a writer in her own right, uh, and she's she's the central character in this production and she's actually in it uh, at 96 years old. She, she was a, uh, a Tai Chi teacher for 15, 17 years at the uh, old senior center uh, before Jane and I took over the Tai Chi teaching. She, she retired and handed it to us when she was 90 years old. Uh, when she was 79 years old, she took up skydiving. <clears throat> so she, this, all of this is in this play. Uh, and I, I've written some music for it, uh, I, if you have time, it's short notice, of course. If you have time, it starts at 2.30, 2.30 this afternoon, so you have time to eat lunch and then get out there and watch it. It's uh, 101 School Street, uh, it's, the, it's called the Berkshire now, it's a, a middle school that's converted into a senior living community. So 2.30 uh, this afternoon in Sheboygan Falls. Uh, I'm going to close with a song that I wrote uh, as we were heading into the pandemic, <laughs> probably the week of the pandemic, and it's uh, based on a based on a sermon that my my uh, father-in-law, uh, who was a retired Unitarian minister from Salt Lake City, he he passed away about four or five years ago, but in his last sermon, 
he talked, uh, it was titled Equality, Liberty, Fraternity. And uh, the, the gist of the, ther of the sermon was that we have tried equality in the form of communism and it was a dreadful failure. And this was this uh, sermon he gave 25 years ago and he said, we are at the end of liberty, the laissez-faire capitalism run amok. The only thing left is fraternity. So. We've gone beyond the tipping point and can't look back. We're blind now, we must see. We've gone beyond the tipping point into the black. We've done now, we must be. Tried to make ourselves equal. We've tried to make ourselves free. The only other thing we never tried to do is to love each other unconditionally. We've gone beyond the tipping point. Where do we go from here? We've gone beyond the tipping point. We're lost in space. Where do we go from here? We've gone beyond the running of this human race. Our course is now quite clear. We've tried to keep ourselves separate, trying to make ourselves free. The only other thing we never tried to do is to love each other unconditionally. We've gone beyond the tipping point. Where do we go from here? The only other thing we never tried to do is to love each other here. Love each other now. Love each other unconditionally. We've gone beyond the tipping point. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? Thank you, John. So that is the end of our show today. But uh, don't feel like you have to rush off, like talk to each other a little. It's not noon, it's supposed to go till noon, so we got a little time. Say hi to a poet, say hi to, thank you for the poets, the readers, thank you for the listeners. Thank you to John and Jane, our sound person. Uh, again, it, this is our 13th year of 100,000 Poets for Change, and so couldn't happen without all of you. Thank you so much. Go We've gone beyond the tipping point. Where do 